I guess at Caltech, I was interested um, in studying string theory, which is a very sort of abstract field of, of physics. It involves a lot of mathematics. And I sort of had planned out how my senior year, I was going to be able to take string theory course from John Schwartz, who sort of invented the theory. But that sort of got derailed when I didn't do so well in some physics classes, and especially the, the laboratory classes. But um, And I also found it I like the rigor of mathematics much better than, than the, the physical aspect. So I never did um, learn a, a large amount about string theory. Now string theory and knot theory, they sound similar, but they're, they're somewhat different. These strings are like in high dimensions and it's a very theoretical theory. I'm, I'm glad I didn't go into that field actually because it sort of reached an impasse where they, um, the, the, they've gone beyond what can be, what can be um, detected in a laboratory. It's just, way too high energy for them to observe these things on Earth. And so they've developed this huge theoretical machinery that sort of um, hasn't really made a connection with reality. And so, whereas in mathematics, we don't have to necessarily make that connection. It would be great if our space, our three-dimensional space, was one of these three-dimensional manifolds that I study, or for example. But in mathematics, you never know what's going to be useful and what's, um, what's going to not necessarily be useful. The field of study that that, that I study and that we're, this is a, a theme of this laboratory is the study of three-dimensional topology or three-dimensional spaces. So um, classically what um, topologists study are spaces where you only care about the sort of global connectedness of the space. So I actually have a picture of a space here in, in two dimensions, the two-dimensional torus. And um, if you were an ant or something crawling, crawling around on this torus, the space would look two-dimensional to you. So uh, like the surface of our earth is, is two-dimensional. And our earth, well, it, it's finite. People used to think maybe that it went on forever, but it turns out that it curls back on, our, on itself. Similar things, but in, in three dimensions. So um, you can get this torus by taking uh, a rectangle and um, gluing opposite sides together. So you glue them together to get a cylinder. And then I can glue these two ends together, so curled around, and I get a, a two-dimensional torus like I've drawn here. So you can think of this, if it's flexible, then you can you can curl it up and make this fine two-dimensional space out of, out of something. Similarly, in three dimensions, we believe that, um, where we know that we can make three-dimensional spaces by taking um, polyhedron in, in three dimensions. So a simple example would be the um, three-dimensional cube. And analogous to the square example I just erased, we could glue opposite sides together. So I could glue this side to this side, and this side to this side, and the front to the um, front to the back. And I would get a three-dimensional space that that's closes up on itself, wraps up on itself. You can't really wrap it up like we did in two dimensions, but in, pr in principle, you could do this in higher dimensions. And let me give it, let me show you what this might look like. So here I have uh, an app called Curve Spaces that was made by Jeff Weeks. And um, what I've drawn here is the three-dimensional torus. So if you were um, living in a space like this, then... Um, well, you can see the you can see the cube there um, in this app. The, these these copies of this cube. So if I went from this cube to the wrapped around, it would also look like another cube next to it. And so you get this pattern of these cubes. If you were living in here, you would see look over here and see another copy of yourself because those two copies of, your, of yourself get get identified. And that's the picture we see here, except we have a, a galaxy instead of a, um, a cube. There's a little spaceship in there that corresponds to me, or to us, and um, we can get rid of the, the galaxy and we'll see, um, see this pattern here. Now there's other kinds of spaces that we can look at, in particular one I'm very interested in, that people are interested in this laboratory are the hyperbolic spaces. So these are spaces where you take other kinds of polyhedra and you identify opposite sides and you get uh, um, a pattern like this. Now, if you lived in a space like this, it would wrap up on itself and you would see other copies of yourself just like we saw in the, in the three-dimensional torus case. And so I, I see all these 
spaceships or airplanes, and these are other copies of ourselves. And with this app, you can sort of follow yourself around and see what happens. And um, <clears throat> what we're trying to understand is how many ways could our, if our universe was finite in extent, so that would mean you would fly in one direction in a spaceship and you could come back to where you started. It would be later in time, but potentially we don't, we don't know if our universe goes on forever like they thought the surface of the Earth used to or if it wraps up on itself. Now, the, the evidence seems to indicate that our universe just goes on forever. There's not, there's not evidence that it's finite. Nevertheless, we study these, these finite dimension, three-dimensional spaces that could be like a, a slice of, of space-time potentially in the, in the universe that we live in. So that's, um, that's, that's a lot of, of what we study. This was a the problem that I only became aware of, uh, I guess a couple of years ago when I had a, a visitors on sabbatical. Josh Green was visiting me at, uh, at Berkeley and he told me about this problem and um, I hadn't really thought about it before but the, the problem is also to do with three-dimensional spaces which again is the, the general topic that I, that I work on and so the, <clears throat> the question here was you have a, a knot which is a, a knot for a topologist is a, is a closed um, <clears throat> loop of strings so here's an example of a non-trivial knot. So there's, if I made a loop of string out of this, um, when I draw um, the vanishing here, there's a, you imagine this made out of string and it crosses over itself. And so we indicate that with these little gaps. Anyway, so this, there's no way to deform this to make a round circle. So this is not equivalent to a round circle, <clears throat> no matter how you deform it. And so in three-dimensional topology, another thing we'd like to study are knots because um, they're sort of fundamental um, aspect of, of, of topology in three dimensions. And um, <clears throat> this, this question that I worked on recently, Gordon's conjecture, was a question of certain um, <clears throat> operations on knots. So I can, take a, I can take a knot and I can try to make it more complicated. So in general, when you deform a knot, you're not allowed to cut it or glue it. But here, we're gonna look at an operation where we cut and glue. So we introduce an extra circle and then we, um, we take a, a little uh, band, we modify the knot to get a new knot. And we do something like this maybe. And then I get a new knot by taking um, this band and um, creating a, a new knot out of it. So I have a potentially what looks like a more complicated knot here. Now if this band was trivial just going over directly, um, like that, then you, you get the same knot, it turns out. But if I do something more complicated, I can get a different knot. And so Gordon's question was, could I do this again? Could I add another band to this more complicated knot, whatever it is, and get back to the figure eight knot that we started with? And visually, if you look at these things, they always get much more complicated, but, um, but people hadn't been able to prove that. And so that was basically Gordon's question from 40 years ago, basically. And, um, and the, the interesting thing is that I was able to prove it using techniques that were 40 years old. So it used like old fashioned technology. A lot of mathematics progresses by building on new ideas and new techniques that people have developed. But it turned out all the, all the techniques I used um, were available 40 years ago. Maybe some insights from more recent work. Um, so I've, I've worked on much more abstract things than not very, you know, these three dimensional spaces I was showing you earlier and various generalizations of that. But, um, it said something about knots that um, turned out to be useful for, for understanding this problem. Although in the end, I, did, I needed um, sort of techniques that were very old. So that's, that's sort of the essence of, of Gordon's question that I, that I worked on recently. Well, we went to the same high school. We were very competitive with each other in high school, so I think maybe that's some aspect of it. But we went to different colleges and um, he's he did a double physics and math major at UC Berkeley now, which is where I'm a professor, ironically. But um, anyways, um, so he he had a, a strong math background and I, I was interested in physics when I went to Caltech, but I ended up studying mathematics, partly because I didn't do so well in my physics lab classes. But I guess maybe that didn't stop Eric. And so, um, but interestingly, his his research has incorporated some some very sophisticated math mathematics about um, about these these planets, like when they pass in front of the sun, trying to figure out exactly what 
uh, how much this, uh, or it's another star, I mean, uh, how much it get, gets dark and he wrote um, an explicit math formula for, for such things and they incorporated into computer code that's been, that's being used by, by a bunch of people to discover new planets and their, and their properties. And so, um, <clears throat> but yeah, we've, um, we've always just in, enjoyed mathematics and science, science more generally. Um, I'm still very interested in physics, but I just haven't, don't have as, as much of a background in that. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it was partly because we were, we went to a, a, a private school in, in Oakland that had a lot of professors kids from UC Berkeley. So we got exposed to that early on. Like before going to high school, I didn't even really even imagine being a professor as an option. And it makes a big um, impact as to what who your um, you know, examples you have in your in your life as to what your possible career paths might be. I didn't really think of being uh, an academic or professor until I went to to a high school where there was um, the parents of the people that, that were like that. And then I met professors and, and learned about mathematics um, as a high school student. And so that had a huge impact on me uh, and, and my brother. I think in choosing our career paths.